This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Neat Tahone, and it is Wednesday, and that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. This week, we're doing a much requested one on power level errata. This is something I have talked about some in my History of the Ban and Restricted List series, and people have really wanted to hear more about it. I have done a top 10 before on cards that needed errata right away. That list was made up of cards that had mistakes that made it to the printer, and this led to the cards not quite working the way they intended in design, so errata was done to make sure the card worked the way they wanted it to. Another type of errata involves modernizing the wording on older cards, but not changing the functionality at all. In this video, we're looking at power level errata, which is a whole different thing. These were changes that were actively made to make cards weaker because they were too good. This is something that wizards used to do somewhat often, something they did sometimes in place of banning or restricting cards, but it was discontinued in 2006, and most cards that had power level errata also had it erased that year. This is not an exhaustive video chronicling all the different cards that have received power level errata over the years, but it is the 10 that I think are the most interesting. We'll talk about why these cards received power level errata, and if necessary, talk about what happened after the errata was removed. We'll also see that some of them still actually have their errata intact for various reasons. Alright, let's move to number 10. At number 10, I have Basalt Monolith. This is a great mana rock, but it doesn't untap during your untap step, and you have to pay 3 to untap it. The problem that was eventually encountered was that the monolith could actually use the mana to untap itself, meaning you can untap it as many times as you want. Now, you're not going to net any mana from doing so, but you could just add another card to the combo like Power Artifact, and suddenly untapping the monolith over and over again means you get infinite mana. As a result of this, Basalt Monolith was given the text, Basalt Monolith can't untap itself. These days, Basalt Monolith has been returned to its original text, and it's a frequently played card in EDH. At number 9, I have Lion's Eye Diamond, a card that still has its fairly confusing power level erratum. When the rules changed and introduced the stack, Lion's Eye Diamond suddenly became too good. If it stayed the way it was originally printed, you could announce a spell you were casting and it would go to the stack. Then you would have the opportunity to use mana abilities to pay for that spell, which you can do with something like Lion's Eye Diamond. You do end up discarding your hand, but the spell on the stack stays there and you can use the Lion's Eye Diamond to pay for it. To prevent this, they added a timing restriction to the card, where you have to do it all at instant speed. This means that unlike most mana abilities, you can't activate the diamond during the casting process for a spell. You'll have to discard your hand before you can use any of that mana. This power level erratum is an interesting one because it was only necessary to fix after a rules change. Funnily enough, even with that erratum intact, Lion's Eye Diamond is a great card in decks that cast stuff from the graveyard and is a really important card in eternal formats. And number 8 is Abeyance, another card that still has its power level erratum in place. This is another change that was necessitated by the 6th edition rules change. Before 6th edition, there weren't things called mana abilities, but now that they were considered abilities, this meant that Abeyance could actually stop the opponent from tapping permanence for mana. To keep this from basically being a better time walk, they had to change the text of the card so that now it explicitly says that the only abilities it can't stop are those that are mana abilities. At number 7 I have two cards because they both received similar power level errata. They are Scorched Ruin and Lotus Veil. Vale. The original intention of these cards was that you had to pay the costs before the cards themselves could be used for mana. When the stack was added, both of these became absurd cards in terms of ramp. Lotus Veil vale was now basically Black Lotus because you could tap it for mana before you had to sacrifice anything. The wording on both cards was altered so that they never entered the battlefield to begin with unless you sacrifice the untapped lands first. This means that they can't tap for mana before going to the graveyard. At number 6 I have Relic Bind, another card that has preserved its power level erratum. As printed originally, you could put Relic Bind on your own permanence, and if you had ways to tap and untap the permanent you put it on, something that wasn't that hard to do at the time, you could do infinite damage in a hurry. 
They gave it an erratum that made it so that it could only be put on your opponent's stuff and not your own. Relic Bind is interesting because, unlike most cards that still have their erratum in place, it wasn't changed because of a rules change. When they retracted a bunch of power level errata back in 2006, Aaron Forsyth noted that they wished they could change this back to how it was, but it had actually been printed with the changed text, and as a result, they had to leave it as it was, to avoid confusion about which printing has the correct text on it. So, the rest of the cards on this list all had pretty significant power level errata that no longer exists today. At number 5, the first of these, we have Karmic Guide. As it was originally printed, the guide triggered regardless of how you put it into play. However, this became a problem, as reanimating a karmic guide or putting it into play by some means other than casting it also meant that you got to reanimate another creature from the graveyard. This had some serious combo potential if you could add some creatures that bring creatures back from the graveyard when they come into play and throw a sacrifice effect in, you could end up with some sort of infinite effect with those components in play. Because of this, they added the if you cast it from your hand clause for the guide to actually let you reanimate something. This was removed in 2006, and it certainly made Karmic Guide better, as it has enabled some silly combos in eternal formats. At number 4, I have Iridescent Drake, which has a similar story to that of Karmic Guide. As originally printed, when it came into play, the Drake would get you back an aura from your graveyard. That is then attached to the Drake. If you combine this, though, with Abduction and a Sacrifice effect, your Drake could just come back infinitely, with Altar of Dementia being the way to abuse this and mill your opponent out all in one turn with a combo. That combo was undone by making the Drake's trigger only work when you cast it from your hand. This erratum has been removed, and today the Drake has its original functionality, and that combo works again. At number 3, I have Palancron, as well as the other free creatures from Urza's Legacy. Like the Drake and the Guide, the problem here arose when you cheated it into play one way or another instead of casting it. This is because it would untap lands, meaning you usually netted a ton of mana, since reanimation spells are a lot cheaper than 7 mana in most cases. Palancron was combined with Recurring Nightmare to do some silly stuff, and Cloud of Fairies could be combined with Aluren for infinite mana. So, they made it so you only got to untap lands if you cast these creatures from your hand. The errata on these creatures was removed, though, in 2006, so you can do these combos right now if you want to. At number two, I have Flash. I think, in general, the top two cards in this list are those that people are the most familiar with as having power level errata, and I have them in these slots because they certainly have the most interesting stories of any other cards that have received power level errata. So, Flash. As it was originally printed, Flash could let you put a creature into play for only two mana that had a powerful death trigger, and you could reap the benefits of that by just not paying the mana for the card. The combo to break the card that triggered the need for this erratum was Academy Rector, which could allow you to put an absurdly powerful enchantment in play as early as turn one with the help of Flash and some fast mana. Namely, you could get Yawgmoth's Bargain, a pretty difficult card to beat that early in the game. Because of this, Flash was changed so that if you couldn't pay the creature's discounted mana cost, it never came into play at all and went directly to the graveyard. This stopped super powerful combos from being a problem. In 2006, they decided to move this erratum, and oh boy, did that break legacy. Combined with Protean Hulk, there were a number of combos you could pull off since you got to get so many creatures into play so early. There were several instant win combos that could be enabled by a dead Hulk. I'm not going to go super deep on them here, since I have covered them in detail in other videos, like my video on the bad cards that suddenly became good, as well as my history of the ban and restricted list series, but suffice it to say, it allowed you to get an easy win far too quickly, and the newly unerotted Flash had to get banned out of Legacy as a result. And at number one, I have Time Vault. I think this one actually has the most interesting history because at one point, the power level errata itself actually backfired. So Time Vault has been around since the game began and it proved to be absurdly powerful when you combined it with anything that could allow you to untap it since you would just get to take infinite turns. In 1994, when organized magic play really began, the DCI restricted and then banned Time Vault because it was too easy to abuse. However, in 1996, they came up with a solution that didn't involve banning it. Now it got a time counter added to it. It did this when you untapped it and skipped your next turn. 
and it had to have that time counter for you to take an extra turn, so there was theoretically no way you could avoid having to skip a turn with it. So now there's no way to abuse this card, at least for a while. Several years later, in 2005, people realized that the way Time Vault worked, you could technically untap it as many times you wanted to, provided you had some way to tap it in the first place, and a bonus to get out of continuously untapping and tapping the card. Enter Flame Fusillade, which allowed you to tap the Time Vault to do one damage, and then you could untap it and skip a turn, then tap it to do one damage, and you could do this infinitely until your opponent was out of life. Skipping all those turns won't come up, because now, your opponent's dead. So once this combo emerged and started to dominate Vintage, it was reworded again in early 2006. Now, it couldn't untap itself as part of its cost. You just chose whether you wanted to untap it during your upkeep, at which point it got the time counter and you skipped your turn. At first, Time Vault was a card they were afraid to remove the power level errata on in 2006, but they eventually did in 2008. And now, Time Vault is back to being super busted, but it's only playable in Vintage, where it's restricted. Well, that does it for this MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to see the over 200 other MTG Top 10s I've already done, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.